And this morning I would like to take some time to talk about truth. We live in a time where we have my truth, your truth, and I want to go deeper than that. What's the basis of your truth? That becomes something that's very important. Because if we have our truth and we want to spin it our way, we may come up with, well, my basis of what I'm saying is from administrative officials. Who in the administration? What administration? Department of Justice, White House. Why don't you name them? What is the basis of your truth in this particular article? What is the basis of you saying that you were born homosexual? It was beautiful. We're looking at this weekend of coverage and film dealing with the homosexual movement for 50 years. They've been striving to find equality among heterosexuals, and they've succeeded a lot of ways, but they want people not only to allow them freedom, but to be able to condone it. It's beautiful. Why can't you say it's beautiful? Well, what's the basis of your truth? You say you were born that way. What's the basis of that? When you say that, well, people are, are homophobic, What's the basis of your accusation? Do we have fear of homosexuals or is it because that we have God as the basis of our truth and God says it's against nature and God says you can change? And we got passages for that. Truth matters. We need to come back and say, you just define yourself and your sexual orientation, that's what you're about? I see you as a whole person. You're trying to find a distinction because of your sexual desires. Oh, I know you call it love. Do you know the Bible calls it desire? Are you going to identify yourself as that? What's the basis? Where are you coming from to make those accusations to have that kind of belief? I think that's a discussion we ought to have, but we need to first understand truth matters. Does it matter to you? Does it matter of what basis is your truth that you believe? I want to set forth the Word of God this morning to help us understand that. When we think about truth, some would say, well, what is truth? That's what Pilate was doing. In John the 18th chapter, Back up into verse 33, Pilate says, you a king, you the king of the Jews? Jesus wants to know from what position are you speaking from? What's the basis of you asking that question? Did you, are you saying it from your own basis or did someone else tell you that about me? He said, am I a Jew? Am I a Jew? Your own people have delivered you. What have you done? And Jesus begins to answer him, since you're not a Jew, you must be coming from the standpoint of the Roman authorities. I tell you, my kingdom is not of this earth. I'm not in competition with Caesar. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants fight and I would not be delivered unto you. That would happen, but my, not, my kingdom is not from hence. Are you a king then? He said, you say that I am, thou sayest well. To this end I came to be a king and to bear witness of the truth. And he that is of the truth heareth my voice. And that's when Pilate kind of goes away saying, what is truth? What is truth? Jesus says, I bear witness of the truth and my sayings are absolute truth. And if you are of the truth, do you want the truth? If you're of the truth, you'll hear my voice. Jesus tells us what truth is. He just told his apostles in John the 14th chapter, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no one cometh unto the Father but by me. So we come to the source of truth, 
the word of Jesus. And we don't scoff at truth. Knowing that if we are truly people, I want the truth, they will hear Jesus' voice. The truth but matters. Because in Luke the fourth chapter, it, it becomes a point of, of making an argument against a, a view that people had. And this was the problem. When Jesus came into Nazareth in chapter 4 and verse 16, here in the synagogue and presented the words that these things are being fulfilled in, in Jesus. And they recognized his words of grace and they were understanding uh, that. But they said, is not this the, the son of, of Joseph? Is not this Joseph's son in verse 22? He came unto it where he had been brought up in verse 16. They were familiar with his family. He's in his hometown. And Jesus is going to be looking from that standpoint. That's where they're coming from. That's the basis of them making a, a statement. It's because of familiarity with him. An idea they're going to have a problem with him being the son of God. And so he doubtless, he says, verse 23, you will say me this parable, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever thou, we have heard that uh, done at Capernaum, you know, you're doing those miracles over there in Capernaum, why aren't you doing it here in Nazareth? Why don't you do it here? Do also here in thine own country. Now, what's the perception? We're not going to accept you as a prophet unless you do it in your home country. And Jesus gives them some facts. He gives them some basis that will answer that position. And listen to how he does it. I say unto you, verily I say unto you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. I know what your problem is, and see, he makes the statement. But of a truth, I say unto you, there are many widows, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when there came a great famine over all the land. Very specific, he brings forth historical fact to make his argument. What's the basis, Jesus, of your answer? Truth is. Reality is. You're going to argue that there were, there were many widows in Israel? No, there were many. But during that famine, there, were only, there was only one widow they sent to, and she wasn't a Jew. And of course, you go to the kings, you'll realize she'd been told that she's supposed to take care of him. And she's about ready to give up for food too. It worked both ways, but he uses that example. He's not through yet. And he says, and, and unto none of them was Elijah sent, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sodom, unto a woman that was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now they got the message. What does he just say? If I don't do a miracle here, I'm not a prophet of God. Fact number one, there were many widows. I was sent to one in the area of Sidon. God sent the prophet Elijah. Was he a prophet because he didn't take care of any of the widows in Israel? No, he was a prophet of God, regardless if he healed any Jew. And Naaman was a leper. Miraculously, he is healed. But he's not a Jew either. Am I a prophet of God if I don't do a work in a miracle in Capernaum? I mean, work, work here in Nazareth? No. Why? Because I got the truth. That's the basis. These are facts. That's how Jesus was related to truth. We need to know what's the basis of what we say is truth. And does truth matter? Well, I want us to understand, first of all, it does. The idea that, well, there are many gods, and we live in a world that has many gods, and we're supposed to be inclusive. But when we come to the Word of God, it makes it very clear from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 that the Israelites, of the children of Israel, says God is one. God is one. 
And in Mark the 12th chapter, verses 29 through 30, we find that what's the greatest commandment is being asked. And Jesus takes them back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, that God is one. And based upon that, you're supposed to love him with all you got. If God were many, you might want to divide between the God of agriculture and, and the God of fertility. The God of commerce? It's not. There's only one God. And the Jews recognized that and commended uh, Jesus for making, for making that, that point when he, when he, when he says... Uh, Verse 32, and the scribe said, Of a truth teacher, thou hast well said that he is one, and there is none other but he. They got it. They knew that. But you know what they mean? That's my basis for serving and loving God without a divided heart, because he's only one. There's only one God. Therefore, why should my allegiance and love toward a higher being be divided? You're to love him with all that you have, all your heart and soul, mind and strength. Based upon that one God, you love your neighbor. God, are you okay with this? I'm to love my neighbor as myself? Isn't that kind of risky, God? No. He created you. He knows you're always out to take care of yourself. You want to survive. You want yourself to be comforted. You want yourself to be comfortable. God created us, and while we give our total allegiance unto him, we treat our neighbor. Listen to the golden rule. Do unto others action that what you would have done to you. That's your thinking process. How would I like to be treated? Hmm. Do that to others. That's God's rule. And it's based upon him that I will love him as I will love my fellow men as myself. But there's no division in my heart. Why? Because truth matters. This is my basis of why I serve God and without compromise. Man's not God. There's only one God. And that demands the action of no divided heart. Truth matters. If you took away the only one God fact, you might not have a strong point about heart being divided. Well, got to save some of that love for something else. No, not when the truth matters in our life. Secondly, there's only one gospel, and it's not of man. Come with me to Galatians, the first chapter. And Paul, from the very beginning of this chapter, is wanting to establish truth. And he wants to establish the truth about his apostleship and his gospel. Notice in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, neither through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Verse 11. For I made known unto you, brethren, as touching the gospel. He makes the same argument. Which was preached by me that it's not after man. Neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through revelation of Jesus Christ. He is establishing his apostleship, the authority for his apostleship, and the authority for his gospel. And neither one of them was from man. He's making the statement of truth that it belongs only from God. It, it started with God on both occasions. And so he begins to give reasons for his statement. Because truth matters. And listen to what he says in verse 12. For explanation. Why do you say your gospel is not after man? For neither did I receive from men, nor was I taught, or it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, For you have heard of my manner of life in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. I made havoc of it, and I advanced in the Jewish religion. 
Beyond many of my own age, among my countrymen, being more exceeding zealous for the tradition of my, my fathers, I persecuted Christians. That was my life. Fact, fact, fact. And he makes the point then to show you that my apostleship and my gospel has a, a base. It's not because I went to Jerusalem and I got caught up with the apostle Peter and I'm just messed up on the teachings of the gospel. That's what apparently is happening in the churches of Galatia with the Judaizing teachers that hold to their traditions and hold to their circumcision as being necessary for salvation. Paul is establishing, I did not get mixed up because I've been hanging out with the apostles. He says, I didn't. I wasn't taught it. I didn't sit down and listen to Peter talk about it. But my former manner of life was totally against the gospel. And I think we find summed up in verse 22, I was still unknown by face under the churches of Judea. I didn't go there. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. But they only heard say that he that once persecuted us now preaches the faith of which he once made havoc. And they glorified God in me. It was powerful evidence. There had been a change. On his way to Damascus to get more prisoners, Jesus appeared to him. That's his basis for his gospel. Not sitting at the feet of Peter. Our other Jews, but you just didn't get it right. <laughs> He's making his argument not, not, not so, because we pick up in verse 15. And when it was the good pleasure of God who separated me from my, even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles straightway, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't get mixed up in my gospel by man. Neither went out to, uh, up to Jerusalem. To them that were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia. And again I returned to Damascus. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. Tear with him just 15, those 15 days. And after the apostle saw a nun say, James the Lord's brother. Now touching the things which I write unto you before God, I lie not. I'm telling you the truth. My apostleship and my gospel is not of man. And if I were still trying to please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. You know why? Because truth matters. And the basis and the authority for his apostleship and the gospel he preached was not that it was of man. The authority was that it was of God. And his life changed dramatically. He's telling you why. And that he wasn't taught it by man. And he wasn't chosen as an apostle by somebody I think he's a good old boy. Let's put him in. It's totally of God. And when men want to mix things and call it the gospel today, like they were doing among the Jews, we want to change the gospel. We want to change the, the good news of Christ. We want to change what God thinks about various things. He said, no, truth matters. And this gospel didn't come from man. It came from God. And what he says about how I should live my life matters to me. But that's the basis of where I'm coming from. See how much it's in our life. Truth matters. It sums up our life if we are people of the truth. Jesus says in John the 8th chapter and verse 46 that, oh, if, if, that he speaks the truth and if that's the case, why don't they believe on him? Jesus says that should follow. That should be in our life that when you understand that I am truth and I speak truth why don't you believe it why don't you believe me he that's of the truth heareth my voice 
Which of you convicted me of sin? If I say truth, why do you not believe me? And believing the truth is very protective of our souls. In 2 Thessalonians 2, in verse 12, truth becomes very important in us dealing with deceit and lies. Here's Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, leading people to believe. What, there's the authority, but it's, it's Satan doing lying wonders. With all deceit, in verse 10, of unrighteousness for them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 12 says, They that all might be judged who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So here was, here was the judgment coming upon those who believe not the truth. Why don't you believe the truth? Because you don't have the love of truth. You're not of the truth. Truth matters, brethren. Do you care about what the truth is and how you think and what you believe and how you act? Or is it just relative? It's essential. It matters. Give me the basis for your belief. You'll have to come to the word of God because I know that didn't come from man. And he says, if I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? If you want to be people of the truth. We are people that obey the truth. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 22, we have purified our souls, as he speaks to them, purified your souls in your obedience to the truth. That truth of the gospel. That word in John 17, 17, that we can be sanctified by thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. That sets us apart. And we have been cleansed from our sins and our obedience to the truth. And what happens is that when God comes in judgment, truth will be very, it, it will matter. Because there will be people that have not obeyed that truth. Romans 2 and verse 8, but of them that are factious and obey not the truth. I'm going to stop there. A factious person. I know here a factious person doesn't obey the truth because I got my truth. How do I know that? Because you say you will obey unrighteousness. That's where you'll go. You're going to obey something. Oh, I just didn't obey the gospel. You're obeying something. There's some reason why you haven't obeyed the gospel because you've you got something else you're relying upon. And, but you don't have the truth. We purify our souls and obedience to the truth, but if we do not obey the truth, we are being factious before God. We want something more important in our life than being a Christian. But what's ahead of you shall be wrath and indignation. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul, man that worketh evil, Jew first and also the Greek. A glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also the Greek. There's no respect of persons with God. Truth matters because we're going to obey that truth. And we are indeed not going to be factious and turn to unrighteousness. We do the truth. You might say, well, that's kind of like obeying it. Yes, but... This takes us to a standard. In John 3 and verse 21, notice how Jesus words this, he that doeth the truth. This is what it looks like. He comes to the light that his works may be made manifest, that they have been wrought in God. See, God is a source of our truth. So you're not afraid, here's what I'm doing, you're not afraid, well, is that right with God? Oh, we don't have to worry about that. Did you have good motives? You want to be right with God? That's all, all that matters. No, do you go to that standard? Do you go to that standard of light? Let the word of God shine. It's sanctifying light upon your deeds that you may prove that deed they've been wrought in God. Truth matters in the things that we believe and we obey and we do. We need to rejoice with the truth. That's our life. 
What causes you to have joy? I tell you what love does. Love rejoices in the truth, not in unrighteousness. Not in unrighteousness, that which is error. It rejoices, not in unrighteousness, but it rejoiceth with the truth. That's love. That's seeking the well-being of others. That's what causes us to have joy in. And we see it applied in the lives of the inspired Apostle John. When in 2 John 1 and verse 4, he makes this statement, I rejoice greatly, I rejoice greatly that I found certain of thy children walking in the truth, even as you receive commandment from the Father. See, he's the source. What is the basis of your truth? God is. And now you're walking in the truth. And you know what I rejoice in? I don't rejoice. Well, you know, they got some children. They failed. They're not living right. And you might take some joy in that because they're not perfect like you're not perfect. You don't rejoice and another person demands. You rejoice because oh, there's some good gossip. There's some exciting out here, and it's based upon lies, and, and it, that's what causes us to rejoice. But coming to services and raising our voices to God in worship and having joy, that, that's no, that's duty. That's burden. That's have to. But what causes me to joy and laugh? These little tidbits of gossip that's probably not very flattering. And uh I know it and you don't. Bringing people down. That's what causes you joy? Because now you see them eyeball to eyeball. Instead of you rising up to do better, just bring them down and rejoice. Them. You don't rejoice in iniquity. When truth is at the heart of your life, you rejoice in the truth. You joy when you see certain of your children walking in the light of the truth, just like God commanded it. Not only do we rejoice in the truth, we speak the truth. Colossians 3 and verse 9, we're to put away falsehood. Paul, why are we supposed to put that to death? Why, why is that so important? Because you're not to lie to one they're seeing that you put off the old man with his doings. Lie not one against another. Lie not one to another. I'm just telling you a lie. And some are very good at that, making you think that it's the truth. But Paul says, you Christians that think you still do that, you're not walking in the truth. Because the truth of the gospel says you died to that old man of sin. You died at baptism and repentance. You put off that old, you crucified him. That's what the world does. That's how the world acts. You don't do that. Because you put off that old man with his doings. Paul takes it a different way. Always, we're not to lie. But he says, Put away falsehood, speaking truth, each one to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We're members in the church. We're a body of Christ. We don't need to have members lying to one another. Function is hard enough. You need to be telling the truth. And a lot of times it's hard for people to tell the truth because they want themselves to be looked greater than they really are instead of dealing with what they really are and that's what a local church should deal with this is what we are how can we get better but we strive to deceive others that's not people that live in a life that truth matters but to a Christian it does and so we tell the truth that's the old man if I don't speak it I got to kill him. And I need to be speaking truth because my brethren, we're one of another. And lying won't work. It strengthens our reputation. 
In 3 John, the third chapter, 3 John, the third verse, John says, I rejoice greatly when brethren came and bear witness unto thy truth, even as thou walkest in truth. The Bible says you got your truth. You got a reputation. This is what people think of you. And you know why it's praiseworthy? Because you're probably walking in the truth. That's the basis for your truth. And when you think about putting into practice all of the demands of God for the new creature in Christ, the character of that person, it is praiseworthy. Are you striving to be that child pattern after truth? You're putting to death the things in Colossians 3? You're putting on the things in Colossians 3? Or does truth matter to you? That's our question. Yeah, truth matters. It's my truth. No, it's deeper than that. Are you walking in the truth? So your reputation, what people say about you, is really the truth. Demetrius fits this. Well, listen to it in verse 12. Demetrius hath the witness of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, we also bear witness. Thou knowest that our witness is true, as he speaks as an apostle. But Demetrius has the witness of all men and of the truth itself. Let's take that off. Let's just throw it over here. The truth itself, get away. And now we've got, you have the witness of all men. Do we stop there? Jesus says in Luke 6, 26, beware when all men praise you. When all men are involved in exalting your reputation. Beware, because they did that to the false prophets as well. How is Demetrius different than a false prophet? It's a man that wasn't out here, I'm going to have a good reputation. How can I lie about this and lie about that in order to develop that reputation of men? No, it starts with, I want the truth. I'm, I'm a person of the truth. And the truth is I'm going to walk after the Lord's commandments. Not perfect, but I'm striving to be. I admit, to, admit my faults and I want to do better. I'm striving each day to be more like Christ. Instead of just saying, hey, it's my truth, it's working, I'll just... No, you come back to the source, the basis of your truth. It's not an anonymous source that says my article will stand, my reputation will stand. Jesus says, you beware when they all praise you and all men do that. That's the way they treated the false prophets. No, you're not a false prophet. You're Demetrius. You're Gaius. And not only do you have a reputation among men, but you've got more importantly the truth itself. The truth itself bears witness of that. I'm just telling you, when you truth matters in your life and you start patting your life after the truth of the gospel, it will strengthen your reputation. It will. And maybe people will not be shocked when your false reputation really exposes who you really are. We don't want to go to judgment that way because he will indeed find out what we are. There's dangers always in pre present. It's why truth matters. We see this in the New Testament, for example, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5. Men are destitute of the truth. And they think godliness is a way of gain. Oh, there's some charlatans out there and out here, around us. They say, you know, godliness kind of gets you in the door. 
I'll have people think I'm a godly person. But the Bible says you're destitute of truth. You really have a love of money. You overthrow old houses in Titus 1 and verse 11. Because of your love for that filthy lucre. Love for that money. You say what you got to say to get more money. But you're destitute of the truth. And we have to be aware of people like that. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7, Apostle Paul is warning, warning Timothy. And here's people ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just think about that for a moment. They study the Bible all the time. Daily Bible reading. He, he, he does that. And he, he's studying his Bible and, and uh, have, you know, goes to all the Bible classes and, okay, that's your truth, that's your reputation. But that might be just a form of knowledge. But you denied the power thereof, verse 5. You may be in the process of ever learning. I want to know something new every day. But you denied the power that should be not being just a form but reality. The power is that truth, the gospel. This is out there all the time. People have a form of godliness. You don't want to be that person. And we must be aware and look deeper into our teachers than just they sure are a studious bunch. Because you can be learning every coming to the knowledge of the truth. And the second danger is that we can turn aside from the truth. Second Timothy 4 and verse 4. We see that that is indeed why you keep preaching the gospel. Timothy. You preach it in season, out of season. Because why? They will not endure the sound doctrine in verse 3, but having itching ears will heap to themselves teachers after their own lust. My lust determines the truth I want to hear. Not people of the truth wanting the truth as a basis. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside unto fables. Hamenaeus and Philetus we see in 2 John 2, 17 through 18. They were men, verse 18, who concerning the truth of Erd. They turned away from it. And they were saying the resurrection is past already. Oh, they weren't saying the resurrection is not going to happen. They weren't denying the resurrection. I think he's referring to that spiritual resurrection that we all enjoy when we come up out of the waters of a baptism and we're a new creature he said that's all you got it's past and it's dangerous because it overthrew the faith of some it overthrows the faith of some but they've turned from the truth and they've erred that can happen to us but it has eternal consequences James praises those who are busy trying to save the soul's not only that have never named the name of Christ, but saving the souls of people who are Christians and they've gone astray. He says, my brethren, if any among you err from the truth and one convert him, let him know, I think, let the one who's converting you know, that he who converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. eternal spiritual death and shall cover a multitude of sins. You can turn from the truth and it has eternal consequences. That's just called destruction. Eternal separation from God. The danger is always there that we can turn away, our eyes get dull of hearing the truth, we want something else, we want something new. He said, well, we're hearing the truth of the gospel. But you're not hearing what you need to hear. And that's why we have to be prepared. So I want the truth. 
What is the basis of what you say is the truth? Not just say, well, anonymous source. That won't work because we are people that demand the truth. And you'll have it in the Word of God. Truth matters. And in our day where truth is relative and truth is anybody's opinion, I think we need to be reminded over and over again in the New Testament that the truth is being emphasized. We're saved by the truth of the gospel. And we have the hope of heaven, as we see in Colossians 1, 5, because of the truth of the gospel. And we offer an invitation to you this morning, to those of you who have not obeyed the gospel. Why are you waiting? Are you being factious and obeying something else in its place than obeying the gospel? Jesus is coming back again. He'll come back to judge us based upon what we've done in our bodies. Why don't you believe me, Jesus says, if I tell you the truth? Are you saying that Jesus doesn't tell the truth? You got your own truth? You need to get through that. Because there's only one way to the Father. It's not your opinions, but it's Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. And he's a loving Savior. He wants to save you. And while... We sing the song of encouragement to you. We encourage you to think about his words and come to Jesus for salvation as we stand and as we sing.